Uh, so hi everyone. Uh, welcome to ICTS String Seminar. Uh, today we have Sunil Saki from TAFR uh, who will tell us about uh, jacket to title bound gravity in second order formalism. So over to you, Sunil. Yeah. Thanks for the invitation and the opportunity to talk. Uh, so uh, this is my recent work, in, uh, which is done in collaboration with my senior Ogmanyu uh, and uh, my guide, uh, Professor Sandi. This work, the talk that this talk is going to be based on this paper, uh, which deals with JQ title bone gravity in second order formalism uh, in the first paper where we did uh, in EDS and, and also a bit in DS. And then in the second paper where we ex uh, explored more uh, about this. Paper. So here is the outline of my talk. So in the first few minutes, I'll talk about uh, JK title going gravity in uh, ADS2, uh, the quantization of this theory uh, in the second order formalism. First, uh, I'll, I'll just describe the procedure uh, elaborately for the case of single boundary without any additional matter, just pure JT gravity. And then uh, I'll discuss about how things uh, extend when we add matter. Then uh, in a similar manner, uh, we'll, we'll go to the discussion of quantization again in the second order formalism, but now with two boundaries. Again, first with pure JT gravity, then later we'll see what are the complications that, ar that arise when we add matter. Following this, uh, I'll try to explain a bit about what happens in Dissiter space, uh, DS2 space time. Uh, there I'll, I'll first uh, start talking about just the classical uh, analysis pure JT gravity classical analysis. And then we will see how matter can be added in a semi-classical context. And then I'll proceed to do the full quantization for uh, one and two boundaries. And then I'll uh, towards the end talk about how this can be generalized for multi-boundary case and the connections to like how the uh, connections between JT gravity in ADS2 and random matrix theory can be extended to the sitter and also make a small proposal about how the random matrix theory can be replaced by SYK. And so how SYK with matter can be uh, thought of as a hologram for JT gravity in this case. So this is a rough outline of matter. So first, uh, just a brief introduction about ADS2 and JT gravity. JT gravity is a two-dimensional direct gravity model, which arises in the near horizon limit of a large class of uh, black holes, near external black holes. This includes the RN black holes and the rotating curve black holes. Okay. Doing a dimensional deduction from such a higher dimensional black hole solutions leads to this class of dilaton gravity models, uh, where the dilaton field uh, characterizes the uh, deviations away from the extremality of the uh, transverse volume. And considering perturbations around this. Uh, constant dilaton ADS2 solution leads to this model of JT gravity. And the model is so simple enough that uh, eventually it will just become a boundary term, uh, even though it's a 2D bulk theory. Uh, once we do the uh, quantization, it will become a, just a boundary term with the action governed by the Schwarzschild for the degrees of freedom, which are called time reparameterization modes. And this quantization for the Schwarzschild theory has been done uh, by Witten and Stanford in 2017. And this result has been extended to arbitrary genus in first order formulation of JT gravity by Sarge Schenker Stanford in 2019. By first order formulation, I mean uh, rewriting the metric, metric and dilaton variables in a gauge theory language with VR binds and uh, spin connections. But uh, in this talk, I'll show how to do the quantity full path integral directly in the second order formalism without going to the uh, language of VR binds and spin connection. Uh, sorry, so, uh, uh, I'm not able to hear you. Uh...
uh, is anyone else able to hear no i am having the same problem uh, hello sunil we are not able to hear you Maybe he's got disconnected or something. It sounds like that because he. I don't think he's. Otherwise, he would have changed his slide. Uh, uh, should I ask him to uh, log out? And we can see his video is working, but I don't think he's saying anything. Uh, his video is live. No, we can see see him. Yeah. Uh, Hi, Sunil. Can you hear us? Uh, so can you just message if you can uh, hear or not maybe the host can message him uh, yeah i can just i'll just message him uh, Hello. Hello. Hello, Sunil. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now. Can you just share your screen? Yeah. Can you uh, allow me uh, from my iPad as my co as a co-host? There so is. Could you, could you hear us when we were saying all this, or you could not hear us? No, I was not able to hear you at all. Yeah. I see. Yeah, may, maybe if you give your yeah phone number to one of the hosts, they can yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah maybe uh, yeah, Anupam can yeah. Okay. Let me let me. Yeah. Any, any just in case it happens again, we we can continue for now. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. Can you see the screen now? Yeah, yeah, I can see the screen. So you you are not able to hear me right from the beginning at all? Uh, no, no. Uh, we we reached up to the second slide, maybe. No, third slide. Next slide. Yeah, this one. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Please continue. Yeah. So, the path integral that we are going to do is uh, with this action SJT, which has a topological term, and uh, another non-topological term, which is is phi times r plus two. All the uh, this topological term uh, is 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 a uh, term that uh, weighs different uh, genus surfaces by this uh, this object Euler characteristic. So let's say Euler characteristic for disk is one, so it will come with e to the minus e to the plus phi naught over four g, and for let's say two boundaries Euler characteristic is zero. So different topologies are just weighed by this uh, parameter. And the actual path integral that we have to do is with this uh, SJT, which has two pieces, uh, phi times r plus two, which is a bulk term and a boundary term, the Gibbons walking like boundary term. This minus one is just a counter term, which is added to render this action fine. The boundary conditions under which we have to do this path integral have to be specified. Okay. 
Uh, sorry, so I can ask a question before that actually. Yes. Sir. So uh, to know everything about the theory, we'd like to know the generating function of correlation functions, not just the partition function, right? So what if I add a source for the deleter? What if you add a source for the deleter? I mean, shouldn't shouldn't we need to know that? So you know, why, why should we only do the, the partition function with no sources added? That, that, that's, that only gives you, and that doesn't tell you all correlation functions. No? So, okay. Um, I guess you can still do the parking trail, let's say, with the source term for deleton. Now, uh, in the absence of any source term, uh, the deleton parking trail is just localize the geometries to ne constant negative curvatures, but then it'll slightly be modified. So, R will be minus two with minus two with an additional term, which is a source term. Yeah, but isn't that significant? I mean, uh, uh, yeah, I, sorry, this is a yeah. more conceptual question. It's not even a space. It's just that in many discussions, I see that people look at the partition function and try to start doing it. But shouldn't yeah. we do more? Shouldn't we Shouldn't we uh, also look at, you know, all correlators? Like, isn't that a meaningful correlator for phi phi? Is that, a, is that a good question to ask? Or that's not a good question to ask at all? Like, I take two points in the bulk and ask, what is phi phi? But is that even a gauge invariant question, like having two points in the bulk for deleton and then asking a correlator? Well, I, I have to dress those points to the boundary in some way. So I say, you know, I look at one point, which is some distance from the boundary, and another point, which is some distance from the boundary. OK. Uh, alternately, you know, here, if you, if you fix r equal to minus 2, then uh, and I might fix gauge, so I, you know, I'm, I, I fix gauge so that I, I have an ADS2 metric. I don't know if that, that gives me a, a lot makes it. You can yeah. do it in maybe in, in the presence of source term, which is let's say a small perturbation, but I'm not sure if it can be done for an arbitrary source term. But I mean, why, why are we focusing? Why is the partition function the right thing to look at? In, in general, you know, that's not the thing we look at usually, right? We, I mean, we want to look at correlators. So this is a very basic question, actually. I mean, this is something that's bugging me. It's been bugging me for some time. Yeah. Like, why, why is this the right thing to look at? Why don't we? Well, usually, we want to know more about a theory than its partition function. Right. This is. Uh, right. yeah. Okay, I haven't thought about this, but let me see. So here you want to be at finite temperature. Yes, yes. Uh, and, and you're saying we'll, we'll compute the partition function finite temperature. Yes. I see. What, what if I'm at zero temperature? At zero temperature. Isn't it still a meaningful question because ADS2 is like a, you know, I mean, it's like some disk and I can still compute uh, this quantity? Yeah, you can still compute the quantity. I mean, uh, the, the, yeah, actually, the answer makes sense for uh, the, the final answer that we obtain makes sense for for any small temperature, but I'm not sure if it exactly makes sense for equal to zero. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. But and, and and why don't we ask questions about correlators? Are you saying we, we shouldn't ask them or I guess the correlators make sense in the boundary theory also. So for instance when you have this ramp and plato uh, behavior for correlators that should be reproduced by some gravity picture. So the bulk picture should also have it in some way. I don't know how. Hmm. No, the, um, the ramp and the plateau are the ones that people generally talk about when uh, in the sense of connected correlations of partition functions, like Z, Z. Uh, gen no, no, no. You can, you, 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 you can, you can insert, you can insert operators in in the middle of e to the minus beta h uh, and generate 
uh, finite temperature correlators, right? Yes. So that's how the correlators are. The correlators also have that behavior, the same behavior as correlators uh, also have the same behavior. The yeah. yeah. Uh, so so Neil, that's uh, reducible from the bulk point of view also, I guess, what Subrat is saying. Yeah, yeah. So, so Neil, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, if I'm not wrong, uh, isn't the answer that uh, Dilaton in this theory does not have any sort of normalizable mode um, by which you could have some sort of quantization in the bulk and then get some uh, endpoint functions of Dilaton? Uh, dilaton just acts the non normalizable mode of the dilaton just acts as a symmetry breaking term and uh, that's all there is so yeah uh, this could be answer to what Shubhat was asking if i'm not wrong this non normalizable i hear you're talking about the lorentzian theory when you talk about the non normalizable mode uh, in the euclidean theory there's never a normalizable mode so if you're doing the euclidean theory, We'll never ask the truth about normalizable modes. We'll just, but you know, there's a path integral, and I mean, doing a integral or d phi, I I mm -hmm. could ask questions about phi of x, phi of x one, phi of x two. You're right. I I need to make it gauge invariant. I otherwise it wouldn't make sense. But maybe if I fix gauge, I fix like conformal gauge. I fix the conformal factor to be whatever one. Maybe then then it's a well defined question or not. One thing regarding what Advait was saying, I can say is this dilaton, unless you impose these conditions that it blows towards the boundary, those are the only conditions which will render the path the variational principle well defined. Yeah, so I was saying that's the non normalizable yeah. sort of mode, but uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I think those are the. I'm not sure if normalizable are allowed. No, no. You, 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 in the Euclidean theory, you never have normalizable fluctuations. So that, that can't be. I mean, maybe you're saying in the Lorentzian theory also right. there are the Lorenz. normalizable fluctuations? Yeah. That, that. I think till now the, the the entire discussion, I mean, the in the literature has been animated by the consideration of spectral form factors and things of that kind, which don't usually involve operator correlator so i think uh, that's why people don't talk about correlators of bulk functions bulk fields i think uh, i mean in the literature there are discussions of bulk correlators but it's not of the lithon you can add scalar fields to this theory and uh, can find uh, uh, correlators for that uh, but not for dilaton and uh, yeah. I, I just want to say one thing you know there is a there is a there, there's a hamiltonian constraint that relates some derivative of the dilaton to the uh, stress tensor of the scalar feedback so like the, you have d mu d mu phi minus whatever yes. g mu yes. d mu yes. box yes. so so if there's a, the, because the bulk stress tensor has a correlator surely the the derivative of the dilaton two point function also has some correlator the question is if there's also a correlator in the limit g d newton goes to zero which which if there's a zero order term in the phi phi two point function and surely there are two point there's a non zero contribution once once uh, you turn on g newton uh, just by the constraint uh, i'm not sure there's also a zero order term uh, you see what i'm saying you know because you have an equation of motion right yeah, d, d mu d nu phi is equal to t mu nu uh, plus yeah. other things, right? So, so uh, uh, certainly, like if you take if you just insert that, uh, you'll find that uh, you know if, if you have t mu nu has a two point function, phi must have a two point function. Yes. yes. But uh, yeah, it, it might have a two point function even without t mu nu. I'm sorry, I, I know I, I understand this theory very poorly, so I'm just asking basic questions. But yeah, we can go on. T mu nu gets multiplied by this g. That that, that correlator we are talking about gets multiplied by g nu. But yes. the question is if the if the phi phi two point function survives in the G Newton goes to zero limit. I, I don't see why it wouldn't survive, but maybe it doesn't. Uh, but if we can go on with your talk, this maybe is peripheral to your talk. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, I haven't thought about this two point two point correlation functions probably. 
I, I'll just go ahead with uh, the rest of the discussion. Okay, so the path integral that we are going to do is with the fixed value of dilaton phi b at the boundary, and the boundary is taken to have some fixed length l. And uh, we'll do this path integral in this in a particular limit called this asymptotic ADS limit, where uh, the dilaton diverges towards the boundary as one over j times epsilon, some constant over epsilon, and length also blows up as some constant over epsilon with their ratio being fixed. So now first we have to understand what the space of metrics that we are going to integrate over. Uh, the space of metrics with the required boundary conditions is itself a Riemannian manifold. And uh, the space of all small deformations around any particular point, let's say some G0 AB, is uh, endowed with a small uh, natural inner product, which is given here, delta 1G times delta 2G. And first, we'll split the space of all small met metric perturbations around any given point into three parts, a conformal part, and a part which is obtained from diffeomorphisms, and the one which is orthogonal to it. And uh, in general, for compacts, compact manifolds, it turns out that all these three are uh, orthogonal to each other. Here, P dagger is the adjoint of P. But in general, when we have a boundary, uh, it need not be so. And we'll see that will introduce a small complication. The definitions of P and P dagger are given here. P acting on a vector field, diffeomorphism is this, and P dagger acting on delta G is covariant uh, derivative acting on delta G. But delta sigma, the ones coming from the conformal factor are always orthogonal to P and uh, kernel of P dagger. Okay. Now for P dagger to be actually the adjoint of P, this requires a vanishing of a particular boundary term that arises uh, during these manipulations. And that is this boundary term, which I call BT here. So, uh, this, this becomes important uh, later on. So first, let's say we start with uh, some general metric, which can locally be written as a conformal factor times some fiducial metric. We'll take this fiducial metric for convenience to be a metric with uh, which is scalar minus two. And since the space of all conformal factors is orthogonal to the space of all diffeomorphisms and kernel of field dagger, the measure also splits up nicely with d of sigma and d of pv. And this d of pv, by which I mean, it includes both small and large diffeomorphisms. So what small diffeomorphisms are the ones which roughly speaking follow fast towards the boundary and they don't change the boundary. And the large diffeomorphisms are the ones which, which actually change the boundary and uh, they cause the fluctuations in the boundary and we have to sum over all those things. Okay. Sorry, uh, when you're when you're summing over the large diffeomorphisms, are you essentially not summing over different configurations which you shouldn't be doing? I mean, when you are suppose you are considering yes, a yes. fixed all the large diffeom all the fluctuation all the configurations which satisfy our boundary conditions that those are diluton is has a fixed value there and the length of the boundary is fixed. Okay. Only those configurations. Okay. Now, for small diffeomorphisms, um, they shouldn't change the uh, boundary, and that would correspond to the vanishing of uh, this boundary term, which translates okay in in a way to this conditions that n a dot v a is zero, and uh, another condition with p v dotted with a tangent vector and a normal vector is zero. The first condition just says that. Um, this vector field shouldn't change the boundary. It shouldn't, it shouldn't have any component in the direction of the normal vector. And the second condition is just the condition of uh, condition that this boundary term that I showed earlier should vanish. So P dagger is actually a dagger of operator P. And so P dagger P is an adjoint operator on the space of this small diffeomorphisms. And these large diffeomorphisms, uh, they are they turning on some large diffeomorphism will slightly change the boundary. And so it is equivalent to cutting out a, a, a particular shape of the boundary uh, in the ADS2 disk geometry. 
So now suppose our boundary is at phi equal to phi b, and then we turn on, let's say we start with some small diffeomorphism and we turn on extra large diffeomorphism, it will correspond to a different boundary. So we have to sum over all such large diffeomorphisms. Let's say if now let, to be more explicit, let's say we start, we fix the physical metric uh, to be of this form. We work in R and theta coordinates. These are the coordinates that I'm going to use uh, frequently in the rest of my talk. Theta is, theta is a compact direction, 0 to 2 pi. Now, any vector field on the disk can be written in terms of two scalar fields as a gradient and a curl. Now we have to classify all the small diffeomorphisms and la large diffeomorphisms. It turns out all the large diffeomorphisms correspond to the eigenvalues of p dagger p operator. Remember, p dagger p p acts on vectors and make make them two component objects, and p dagger converts two component objects to one component object. So essentially, it's a map from one component objects to one component objects. So p dagger the eigen I, the space of eigenvalues of p dagger p act uh, with zero eigenvalue, the last diffeomorphisms are included in this class. And the non-zero uh, space, the space of non-zero eigenvalues correspond to small diffeomorphisms. And remember, we still have, we have to always keep in mind that the small diffeomorphism should satisfy certain boundary condition. And, uh, and the large diffeomorphisms should also have this length of the boundary to be fixed. Okay, now, it turns out even among these vector fields, the curl and the gradient part, it's only the curl part that correspond to the large diffeomorphisms. So, so let's say we the now let's say now we are starting to look at the eigen modes of p dagger p operator, and that after some simplification becomes an eigenvalue equation like this: del square minus two operator acting on a scalar is lambda times a scalar. So if you if you find out all the eigenvalues of this equation, they are in one to one correspondence with the eigen eigenfunctions of this p dagger p operator. Now since we want to look at last diffeomorphisms, we look at lambda equal to zero subspace, for which we will get two sets of solutions, and out of which we will take only one by imposing the regularity condition at the origin. So it turns out these are the solutions which are regular at the origin. You can see uh, origin corresponds to r equal to one. So this near the origin goes like r minus one to the some positive power. The other set of solutions correspond to r minus one to the negative power. So we'll discard them. And the corresponding vector field and the metric perturbations are given like this. Now we have to compute the norm for this, uh, the measure for these vector fields. And uh, this is easy. We just plug in uh, this metric, but two of such metric perturbations into the uh, inner product that I showed earlier. Let me just show it again. This delta 1g into delta 2g and compute the norm for this vector field. You'll get some uh, measure for the c hat coefficients. Uh, that also the action for these metric perturbations stays finite in the asymptotic ADS limit, essentially because of the fact that we are in a very low dimension d equal to 2. And also this and also for the fact that these large diffeomorphisms are asymptotic isometries in this one. Uh, Sunil, uh, sorry, quick question. Why is lambda equals to zero subspace the space of large diffeomorphisms? Uh, um, you can see it um, from the point of view of the fall of conditions. You can uh, let's say we, we are looking for asymptotic isometries. You can see that once you solve this equation, the general equation for uh, lambda not equal to zero will be some associated Legendre function. And then if you look up, look at the fall of conditions for those functions as R goes to infinity, you'll see that only lambda goes to lambda equal to zero set corresponds to the ones which generate the asymptotic isometries. So probably that's one way to see it. Okay, thanks. Also, uh, this we have split the measure into two factors, the conformal factor and the diffeomorphisms. Here again, there are small diffeomorphisms and large diffeomorphisms. It actually turns out 
that this large diffeomorphisms and small diffeomorphisms are not totally orthogonal, but they are only orthogonal uh, in this asymptotic ADS limit. So if you compute that inner product, uh, which is shown here, you'll see that it will go like one over the location of the boundary to the power three halves. So only in this limit, this RB goes to infinity, that this inner product becomes orthogonal between small and large diffeomorphisms. Also, the inner product between two large diffeomorphisms is a complicated object, but in the limit R going RB going to infinity, large RB, where uh, let's say this M square minus one term or can all be ignored, you will get a measure which which is the simple measure. And uh, you can see that this measure is the one that is used generally the, the standard symplectic measure in the computation of Schwarz and path integrals. It, when, it doesn't have any measure for m equal to zero and plus minus one modes. And actually m equal to zero and plus minus one modes, if I remember correctly, correspond to this isometries, the actual iso SL2 or isometries of the ADS2 space. So, yeah. so now, since we have understood this path, uh, the measure for large diffeomorphism, we'll start doing the path integrate. First, we'll uh, do the dilaton path integrate. Let's say by uh, expanding around some classical solution with the appropriate boundary condition for the dilaton. And uh, uh, this delta, the expanding the fluctuations around the classical solution, these fluctuations have to satisfy uh, Dirichlet boundary condition. And then we'll get a delta function uh, doing the dilaton path integral which will localize the space of matrix to constant negative curvature matrix. Sorry, so are you holding the boundary fixed or are you kind of varying it and summing over the variations? No, I'm only imposing the condition that phi is fixed on the boundary. The boundary can be fluctuating. Oh, so other phi, the metric is varying, for instance, but the yes. phi is fixed. Yes. Okay. Okay, now... Uh, this Ricci scalar, uh, in terms of this conformal factor, this, this is a Ricci scalar for the full metric, including the conformal factor, which is uh, given here. And that delta function will actually localize you to uh, sigma equal to zero. Because uh, we have the condition that the length of the boundary also has to be fixed. So now, once we, so once we, do the sigma path and the sigma the measure for the sigma can also be computed from the uh, inner product that i showed uh, earlier and uh, that will also involve some sigma dependence but essentially since this delta function will localize you only to sigma equal to zero it will only mul multiply the overall answer by some constant factor which which we are not anyway keeping track of so we can ignore those satellites and So the the sigma path in, the integral over this conformal factor will give a determinant del square minus two, which has to be uh, now evaluated uh, on this fiducial metric g hat. In in general, this determinant is not easy to compute for a general boundary, and uh, there must one has to carry out a regularization procedure to compute this determinants. Our definition of asymptotic ADS limits actually involves the prescription for computing this determinants in the sense that we, let's say when we are computing a data, uh, com some computing some eigenvalue and regulating the determinant, we first take the asymptotic ADS limit where we take the, let's say the location of the boundary to infinity and then take the uh, cutoff on the eigenvalues uh, to infinity. So this is part of the prescription of the asymptotic ADS limit. Otherwise, it's in general hard to compute this determinants. Okay, so now, so we, after we do the sigma, uh, the integral over sigma, this integral over uh, the diffeomorphisms will now break up into integral over small diffeomorphisms and the large diffeomorphisms. And we, we have a can factor here uh, I, I forgot to talk about this factor earlier on. So there is a volume of gauge group and that volume of gauge group corresponds to actually the volume of the small diffeomorphisms. So- 
I have a question. Yes. So in the usual ADS-CFT dictionary, when you are computing boundary objects, you usually say that the boundary, the shape of the boundary or the whatever, the boundary metric is held fixed, right? So uh, if you vary the metric, then uh, I mean, how do you, I mean, if you vary the metric and sum over the metrics, then what exactly does it mean from the ADS-CFT point of view? So here we are not, I mean, varying the metric, I only mean varying the shape of the boundary. That is only physically. Yeah, so usually you hold the shape of the boundary fixed in normal ads -CFT. Yes. Here there are no local degrees of freedom. All you have is the shape of the boundary. Yeah, but you're varying the shape, right? Yes. Those are the actual configurations you have to sum over. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so now this, uh, after doing the integral over uh, the small diffeomorphisms and cancelling out the volume of the uh, small diffeomorphisms, uh, in the process, we'll get this determinant P dagger P from the Jacobian for the small diffeomorphisms. This determinant of del square plus two is coming from the uh, integral over the conformal factor. And then we have the integral over the large diffeomorphisms. And these large diffeomorphisms, the action for it is given by this boundary term for JT theory which is, is uh, phi b times k minus one. In the asymptotic ADS limit, this uh, action just becomes shortion of tan of this function theta of u by two. So now parameterizing theta of u as u around identity by some coefficient c hat, uh, we can do this path integral. And the result for this path integral is uh, here in the last line. There are various terms here. E to the phi naught over 4G is just coming from the topological term of JT gravity. E to the pi times 4 pi. This is uh, this this can be computed at the saddle point level also. Uh, but this term, 1 over uh, Gj beta to the power 3 half, this is actually the contribution that comes from the one loop determinant. And this answer exactly matches with what Witten and Stanford had calculated. Uh, directly from doing the Schwarzschild path integral. Okay, actually I have glossed over one subtlety. Here these determinants can in general depend on the large diffeomorphisms. But since we are working in the asymptotic ADS limit, uh, one can argue that, that these determinants uh, can in general depend on large diffeomorphisms only in this manner via length term and uh, Schwarzschild term. And through dimensional analysis, one can see that uh, it should come multiplied by this epsilon factor. And in the limit epsilon goes to zero, we can add a counter term that subtracts this length dependent term. And so we, we end up not having any um, contribution uh, from the determinants to the action of the large diffeomorphisms. So this was one, one small subtle point that, uh, that is important. So in the usual JT gravity description, when you go from, when you derive the Schwarzian and the, say the Stanford Witten way, do they hold the boundary fixed or, or are they summing over bound, boundary shapes? Do they, in, in their calculation, do they hold the boundary fixed in some way? No, it's, it's, it's sum over all um, shapes of the boundary. It's not, the boundary is not held fixed. Okay. Okay, I should be able to give a better answer. Uh, I'll just make one one comment. Actually, there are two two equivalent descriptions uh, in the path integral of this theory. You can fix the metric and uh, integrate over all different shapes of boundary, physical shapes, or you can fix the coordinate value of the boundary and integrate over all large diffeomorphisms. Yeah. So in the in the Malgusana paper, the original papers, um, they had, uh, they just say, there are words, but um, basically measure for both of these things will come out to be the same. But there are two equivalent ways. And I think in this, in Sunil's work right now, he's 
actually integrating over large diffeomorphisms by fixing the coordinate value of the boundary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These are active versus passive kind of things. Yeah, I mean, uh, either you vary the metric or you vary the shape. It amounts to the same thing. They're complementary, but uh, yeah. So I guess if if they if those if Maldasena et al do it that way, then I guess this is the same thing that you're doing. Okay. Yes. Okay. Now let me uh, proceed, and uh, now we'll add matter. The procedure for the space of all again we have to uh, now do this path integral uh, with the integral over the matter configurations with the action uh, given by this i'm just considering free uh, minimally massless coupled scalar fields for which the action is given by this and there are n number of matter fields these don't couple directly to the dilaton so this is one sim huge simplifying factor the most of the steps that i had described earlier just go through uh, it's only when we come to the step of doing the integral over the large diffeomorphisms that we have to be careful. We'll carry out this path integral for uh, matter fields with Dirichlet boundary conditions for some fixed boundary values. Okay, so after doing the integral over small diffeomorphisms, the conformal factor, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, we'll finally end up here. Okay. Uh, Actually, in this step, there is still. Like, can, I, can I re ask my, one of my questions, some version of this question? Uh, mm -hmm. so, you know, once you add matter, uh, in principle, shouldn't you work with the quantum effective action? So, I mean, uh, the quantum effective action is not the same as this classical action, right? When we are computing the partition function. So, why don't we worry about that? I mean, okay, maybe in pure JT, you don't have to worry about it, but certainly in matter, there'll be matter loops which will lead to higher order terms, right? In the effective action. Yes, yes, yes. Why don't we worry about them? No, actually, yeah, we should worry about them and we should compute if we are to keep track, like if you are to do the path integral exactly, we have to do it that way. But it can be done. I mean, I'm not saying uh, it is, uh, one can do it, uh, but I, I don't have an expressions. Ex exactly. Can you can take into account matter loops and, and compute the effective action. And I, yes, yes, definitely. Yes. Sorry, but where yeah. is it being done? But, where? Who has done this? Uh, no, actually, uh, what people do is, uh, uh, I guess, uh, in in the in the so suppose suppose you are doing QED, right? I mean, in the action in the path integral, you don't have the one loop action. You have the you have just the tree level action, and the path integral generates all the loops and the quantum effective action. Yes, so I think the spirit is the same here. Yes, yes. No, all I'm saying is, suppose the, once we are at the step of integrating over the large diffeomorphisms, this matter fields also coupled to the large diffeomorphisms. And you can start looking at the perturbations to, let's say, correlation functions to the matter fields due to this Schwarzian. That has been done. I see. Right. In a perturbative manner. Right, right. Yeah, I, maybe it's actually exactly the same question as before, because to compute the quantum effective action, you would need the generating function. You'd need to add sources and then do the partition function. So yeah. it's the same same question as before, maybe. Yes. yes. Yeah, but that, that that has I guess has not been done, right? In some explicit way. I think I know it has been done perturbatively, order by order, but yes. I don't remember if it was done to all orders in uh, perturbation theory. Okay. In a close yeah. I vaguely remember some some results from Maldasena's paper, but I'm not sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so yeah, the mat at, after this step, uh, this uh, integral over level, uh, level mode, we can do the matter path integral and that will just give this uh, on shell action for the matter fields with, uh, which depend on the boundary values and the determinant, the scalar determinant. Okay. In general, both of these again can depend on large diffeomorphisms, but if we work in the asymptotic ADS limit, this determinant the dependence from the uh, determinant is uh, not there for large diffeomorphisms, but still there is this e to the minus s matter classical, which depends on the boundary values of the matter fields and which can, which in general couples to the large diffeomorphisms. And uh, that s matter classical is uh, given here. This theta of u involves the time reparameterization mode. Uh, if you expand around, let's say, unity, you get some complicated 
expression involving the time reparameterization modes. And uh, you can do the integral over this large diffeomorphisms morphisms better way to do. But uh, I mean, in the, uh, yeah, so you can include this correction systematically. There are two parameters here, one over G Newton, and there is an uh, N uh, for coming from this sum over matter fields. You can work in different, uh, different limits. Let's say G Newton going to zero first, uh, or G Newton going to zero and going to infinity with G Newton fixed. So let's say we are working in G Newton going to zero and N going to infinity with G Newton fixed. We can, uh, we are taking the quantum effects of matter fully and we are only working in the classical approximation for, uh, for gravity. So it will be a semi-classical analysis, but in general, one can uh, do the more complete analysis for which I, I don't have any closed form expressions. Okay, uh, so that's all for uh, the disk topology. Now, now I'll, I'll briefly describe uh, the same story for uh, ADS2 with two boundaries. Now, again, the fiducial metric can be taken to be R equal to minus two. Uh, the two boundary, so the reference metric that I'm going to work with is this R square plus DR square over R square plus one and R square plus one D theta square. Now the theta direction is a compact direction with theta, the, the, uh, the size of this theta direction being a parameter. So actually now the, these geometries have two moduli. In the case of this, there was no moduli, uh, but here we have two moduli, the size of this theta circle and the relative twist between the two boundaries. So we'll get additional uh, metric perturbations due to, corresponding to these two moduli and we have to integrate them over in the space of all metric configurations. Okay, again, the boundary conditions here uh, are that dilaton takes some fixed value at let's say left and right boundaries. Uh, and- Could you uh, go back to the previous slide, please? Yes. So are you, what do you mean by taking R to minus infinity? R starts from zero, right? R is a radial parameter. No, here, here, uh, no, it's actually uh, a cylindrical kind of, uh, sorry, uh, let me do it. No, th this has a topology of a cylinder. And one end of it corresponds to R going to infinity. The other end corresponds to R going to plus infinity. R equal to zero is the uh, center of this uh, cylindrical topology. And that has this size theta equal to uh, the, the geodesic size of the, the size of the geodesic at that point is B. It's not a disk topology, it's a cylindrical topology. No, even if it's a cylindrical topology. Yes. Uh, you have R and theta, right? I mean, so R and theta parameter. R is, is the... not, I mean, there's, it's not ra radius of anything. What is it then? Uh... Sorry, I'm, I'm not able to draw anything, but all I'm saying is, see, uh, there is a cylindrical topology and theta is a direction which, uh, which specifies this compact direction and R is a direction which specifies the length of the, uh, which is a coordinate along the length of the cylinder. Then what specifies the radius of the cylinder? No, it's a 2D surface, right? There's no bulk for the cylinder. See, this is a 2D geometry. In that case, in that case, R would be something which is fixed. No, R is a parameter which is which specifies where on the cylinder, where at the. Uh, see, suppose you have let's say a uh, horizontal cylinder, and there is a coordinate that tells you where on this horizontal cylinder you are, which location of the axis here, which point. 
that's like a z coordinate that's not a radial coordinate yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so yeah, but that z coordinate is 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 a is a linear coordinate if i mean it varies linearly i mean it is like a linear function right yes but so in in that case what should the metric look like if you have a dz should that dz have any sort of gzz sort of thing because it's just a it has no curvature so just a hello uh, can i can i add some hello yes uh, can't we see this geometry as uh, gluing two discs along the center and then that radius of that that this r is the radius of that discs two discs with the boundaries and they are glued along the center i'm not sure if you can think of it like this gluing along the center what do you mean along the center at the origin like we we cut out some disc from the origin uh, okay. and then we glue the annulus part of both the discs and then this r becomes the radius along that disc so that is a geometry with two boundaries that is a geometry with two boundaries but i'm not sure if, if you can think of this as gluing of two discs like that no i think what he is saying one way think, to sorry go i think i think what is saying is i think uh, resolves the problem because if you you are essentially dealing with a wormhole right you, you want yes. to disrupt wormhole yes so you have you have uh, two discs at the end and then the interpolating uh, coordinate or whatever the wormhole the, the surface of the wormhole is parameterized by r and theta right that's yeah. the, the yeah. idea okay go ahead okay uh, i i don't have uh, some actually one can easily see this from the embedding coordinates if you uh, look for go to the embedding coordinates and try to uh, compact phase is theta direction uh, you'll actually see that uh, r goes to minus infinity plus infinity and you'll have two disconnected boundaries with a connected geometry yeah except that it's not a cylinder it's kind of a something that tapers off from the two yeah, yeah. boundaries yeah 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 when i mean I, cylinder I, i was just stripping out the conformal factor and then calling it a cylindrical topology but yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. okay okay now the boundary conditions are uh, the dilaton blows up towards each of the boundaries independently and the ratio of length of the bound length also blows up uh, in a in a proportionate manner and the length of the boundary the ratio of the lengths were uh, to dilaton at each of the boundaries is a fixed fixed number again as before we split it into conformal perturbations and uh, the tra traceless perturbations this traceless transverse traceless perturbations will involve uh, Uh, the large diffeomorphisms small diffeomorphisms and the diffeomorphisms and the moduli uh, metric perturbations each, for each of this we can compute the norm again using the standard inner product i'm i'm not going to show all the details of the large and small diffeomorphisms uh, but just the moduli the the parts corresponding to the moduli uh, if these uh, for one of the moduli the uh, the related twist between the two boundaries it can be generated from uh, m equal to 0 m equal to 0 sector of the uh, diffeomorphisms m equal to 0 i mean e to the i m theta uh, the mode number m corresponding to theta so this there are two solutions one of which is actually an isometry and the second one actually corresponds to the relative twist you can construct a vector field out of it and uh, you can see that as Uh, r going to plus infinity it will have some value and r going to minus infinity it will have some other value and that introduce this vector field introduces a relative twist between the two boundaries now there is another vector field uh, for the modulus uh, which changes the periodicity of the theta circle b is the periodicity of the theta circle and if you are changing b you are changing the uh, periodicity of the theta circle and uh, once you have the vector field you can construct a metric perturbation out of it and you can compute the the corresponding uh, uh, measure for this metric perturbation it turns out uh, the space of uh, the small diffeomorphisms large diffeomorphisms and the moduli 
again become orthogonal and in particular the large and small diffeomorphisms are orthogonal only in the asymptotic ats limit so once we but the moduli and large and small diffeomorphisms are actually orthogonal they don't require asymptotic ats limit and in this limit you can uh, do the integral over small diffeomorphisms uh, to get this p dagger p factor integral over the conformal factor again gives this del square minus 2 factor now you have two two terms in the action one corresponding to the left boundary and one corresponding to the right boundary you have an integral over large diffeomorphisms and uh, you have an integral over moduli this b db is actually coming from this factor of b is coming from the integral over the twist modulus the relative twist can only have a range between 0 to b so that is this b factor and uh, db is whatever you get for the the b modulus okay, so i never understood this why should the relative twist have a range from 0 to b why can't it exceed b because i can twist yeah. it b also right okay 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 in general mathematicians actually talk about this being from minus infinity to infinity but physically for the geometry we have i mean we only consider twist between 0 to b right? and why is that um, because a, a twist more than b i think since theta is an I identified direction in theta plus b uh, no but but if you suppose suppose you uh, suppose you have two boundaries uh, facing each other mm -hmm. you join them then you twist one of them you twist one of them to an entire 2 pi okay, okay. and then you can imagine twisting it further also right i mean that would not be the same as being the same twist as uh, the previous set of twists which have been twisted by some suppose you twisted suppose you twisted but twisted by b, b, b plus say epsilon Yes. That would not be equivalent to a twist by epsilon only, right? I mean, that's that's the sense in which I'm calling it a twist. The twist parameter runs only from 0 to b. Yeah, so that's the question. Why Why is it held that way? I, I never understood this. I mean, you can keep on twisting and the, the further twists will not be the same as being identified with other twists are of which are of the same magnitude but modulo b right hmm. you are saying if you are twisted by more than b it's not correct to call them identify it with a twist it's smaller than b no uh, yeah yeah um, so physically but uh, if you look at Let's say if you fix one point on the left boundary and uh, you have a twist, you introduce a twist on the right boundary relative to this boundary. Shouldn't you call a twist which is more than B, uh, identify that with a twist which is less than B because your theta direction is anyway identified with. No, B. Suppose, suppose you take one of the cylinders, okay, yeah. and you twist one of the cylinders by epsilon and yeah. you join them, join the two cylinders. Yes. And then you twist that cylinder itself by B plus epsilon. That's a different twist altogether, right? It twists much more than the just epsilon. Uh, I'm sorry, just to clarify this, uh, to, by twist, you mean just identification of two cylinders uh, taking theta from one and adding theta plus C. And just rotate one of the cylinder and then connect them. That's the that's the meaning of twist here, right? Yeah. That would see that that would just be that would not correspond to a twist. That would just simply correspond to a translation in theta. By a twist, I suppose people mean that uh, you are just twisting the boundary, keeping the rest of the. I mean. You are not you are, by by twist. I, I don't suppose people mean that you are applying a universal twist over the entire cylinder. Yes, uh, no, it doesn't that, make sense to say, yes. Doesn't make sense to say that you are twisting when you say that you are just translating. You are just translating by theta, right? Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, no, it should be a relative thing between two pieces. So, 
when I described here the vector field for this, if you look at this vector field, at one end, this will introduce at which which is zero, and at the other end, it will introduce at which which is this parameter t. It's not uniform all throughout the cylinder. Yeah, that, that's what I'm saying. So if it's not uniform all throughout the cylinder, then a twist by B and a, a, just epsilon and a twist by B, B plus epsilon should deform the cylinder in diff different ways, right? So they should be considered different. Okay, the way I was thinking it was, suppose you introduce a twist which is more than B, I, mean, I thought it should be identified with since theta is theta plus yeah, B. it would have been identified with the previous twist if if the if the if the understanding was that the whole cylinder was rotating, but a twist doesn't mean that. I mean, by twist you mean you are just twisting the boundary and you are considering the deformation of the entire cylinder due to that twist. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay, I actually don't have any good answer for this, but uh, but here the twist goes to uh, the full end of the boundary, right? It's not like just twisting the circles which we are flowing at. Like even at r going to minus infinity, the vector field is non-zero. Yeah. It is T. Yeah. So, so the so the end of the boundary is uh, undergoing the same rotation as the uh, place where it, the twist is occurring. Now here uh, it seems like. Then, then, then why call it a twist? I mean, I mean, uh, then. Okay, so if that is the case, then it's just a translation by theta of, of the whole cylinder, right? Now here, uh, let's say I'm comparing the twist between the two ends, r going to plus infinity and r going to minus infinity. So the relative twist between them is t. One end I, I have zero, and the other end I have t. Yeah. So if if the two cylinders, yes, if the if the boundaries of the two if the if the endpoints of the two cylinders are kept fixed, that's what that's what you're saying, right? And you're twisting the middle, right? No, no, I, I'm twisting one end related to the other. Twisting, no, so, okay, so you, okay, so the cylinders, you're twisting the ends of the cylinder or are you keeping uh, the ends of the cylinders fixed and twisting the middle where the boundaries are being joined? No, that will, that will generally, yeah, people, when people say twist, they mean you, uh, you introduce a, let's say at r equal to zero, you introduce a sudden shift between the two para, uh, introduce a discontinuous shift between the para thetas. But here, what I'm saying is uh, this vector field will introduce a continuous twist. All I'm saying is you, you're, I'm only talking about the related twist between the two boundaries. It's not, I'm not just looking at one end or the other end. Yeah, a relative twist can only occur if the boundaries are held fixed. And the twists at the middle are different for the different cylinders, right? Yes. Yeah. So in that case, uh, what I'm saying still holds, right? Because you're still holding the cylinders, the boundaries at the two ends of the cylinders fixed. And you're twisting the middle. You're not as if you're not rotating the entire cylinders altogether, right? Sorry, I'm not understanding what you mean by boundaries being fixed. You are whole, you are not rotating the entire cylinder by theta. You are just twisting yeah. the. You are just twisting this the circle in the center, where it's being joined. Yes. Suppose I have two mark points on the two ends, and initially let's say they are in they are connected by some straight line. Now, you, if you twist slowly the right right boundary, this mark point on the left boundary is still fixed. Only the mark point on the right boundary is being move along the theta circle, right? That's what I'm calling it twist. 
what is a mark point let's say i'm just marking two points on two bound on the circles of the left boundary and right boundary yeah and suppose there is a geodesic connecting with these two points yeah all i'm saying is this vector field v theta yeah is keeping the left mark point or uh, here the right mark point fixed and introducing a shift in the left mark point along the circle yeah, yeah. and that's what i'm calling to is, is yeah so so that, that that i agree i mean but my point is that if if you do that yeah. why should you consider why should you consider twists which are by which are modulo b different i mean the same as each other why should you consider twists which are modulo b fresh with respect to each other as being the same maybe you can shift this discussion to the last or something okay sure okay okay so the short answer is i was thinking once you shift it more than b you identify it with something less than b but okay i have to think okay go ahead yeah if you allow me to take zero to b as the fundamental domain of this twist parameter then i'll get this factor of b and now uh, we have to do the integral over this last diffeomorphism so so now this integral over this last diffeomorphisms will uh, give uh, give this part which is 1 over square root beta 1 times beta 2 and then the integral over b will give this final result which is square root beta 1 beta 2 by beta 1 plus beta 2 which again agrees with whatever has been obtained in the first order formulas uh, in terms of uh, the weir binds and spin connection okay, now the final integral uh, sorry the final integral is going from 0 to infinity right the b integral runs from 0 to infinity yes uh, okay w what do you mean the final integral yeah, yeah the last line yes yes here the b integral runs from 0 to infinity oh in that case i guess uh, the thing is resolved right because if you integrate from 0 to infinity then yeah. you are essentially summing over yeah. all possible twists right yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. sorry yeah Okay. Okay. Now the interesting thing here is when we add matter. Much of the story goes through as before. Uh, for now, again, uh, let me consider free massless matter with uh, Dirichlet boundary conditions, and then uh, uh, Dirichlet boundary conditions. I mean, with no source, no boundary values for the scalar fields, just for simplicity. The interesting that happens here is this. determinant of uh, the scalar laplacian actually depends on the modulus parameter b and that will introduce a new twist here this z matter of b which which is this determinant as a function of b is given by this expression uh, which involves this dedicated data function again in the asymptote but the, the rest of the pieces it can be argued that the determinant of p dagger p by determinant of del square plus 2 the b dependence from these cancels off so there won't be any additional b dependence from these pieces but it's only this determinant of del square which which will actually give the b dependent part and that uh, actually blows up in the limit b going to zero so once you put this additional matter fields with periodic boundary conditions what is happening is there is a casimir effect due to this uh, matter fields and that will introduce a b going to zero divergence and the divergence is this e to the pi square over 6p so as b going to zero it goes like e to the 1 over b which diverges and there is nothing else in the path integral which can contract this divergence so once you put matter fields the double trumpet partition function becomes an ill defined quantity uh, but remember this is for periodic boundary conditions for matter fields and one resolution for this could be can we Uh, make this casimir energy positive so when i mean here e not, casimir energy e not is minus 1 over 12 i'm thinking of it so the size of the theta circle is b uh, you can always strip off you can bring the double trumpet part uh, the metric in a conformally flat form uh, in which theta circle is 0 to b and the other direction runs from 0 to pi uh, since we are only talking about 
conformally invariant uh, objects. So here uh, it, you can rescale theta to go from zero to two pi, and the other direction will become uh, pi square over b roughly. And so the Casimir energy, uh, instead of being minus one over twelfth in this picture, if you uh, can make it positive, then we can uh, get rid of this divergence. And one way to get rid of this divergence is to introduce non-periodic boundary conditions for the matter fields. So let's say now if you introduce some uh, non-periodicity in the matter fields with some parameter alpha, so as along this compact direction theta, the matter field once it winds around theta, uh, picks up a phase e to the 2 pi i alpha. That will introduce an additional term into this Casimir energy ground state, which is an alpha dependent object. Okay, So when alpha equal to zero, uh, you can see this is uh, negative, but when for certain values of alpha, you can actually uh, make sure that, that this E naught is positive. And in those cases, uh, we don't have any divergence from the matter fields. Okay, so that is a part, uh, there are there, there have been some other proposals like instead of working in this canonical ensemble where we are fixing the temperature we can go to the micro canonical ensemble where we fix the length of where we fix the energies but uh, we actually showed in our paper that that also doesn't work so it's only the special case uh, using the special boundary conditions that we can uh, actually tame the divergence of the matter fields Okay, that ends the discussion of uh, Euclidean uh, ADS uh, JT gravity. Now, I'll just briefly describe about De Sitter JT classical and semi classical analysis. I don't know how much time I have. Uh, can someone tell? Uh, how much time do you need actually? I might uh, need uh, roughly 20 minutes. Yeah, I think you can go on. Yeah. Okay. So in De Sitter, uh, the action is almost similar. R plus two became R minus two. Here we don't add any uh, counter term by hand. In ADS, it was natural to add this counter term, but here we don't. The the boundary term is just uh, root five times k. The dilaton and the metric equations of motion are given here. This is R minus two condition, and uh, this is the metric equations of motion. I haven't shown the matter action, but uh, suppose there is a matter action, you'll get a stress tensor due to the matter. In the absence of matter, the gen general solution is for the uh, metric and the dilaton, you can write it in this form, one minus mu x plus, x minus by x plus minus x minus. This is Poincare coordinate system for the metric. And here mu can take either positive, negative, or uh, zero value. I've actually used SL2R invariance to bring the dilaton to this form. In general, it will be a three parameter set of solutions, but you can use SL2R invariance to get rid of two parameters. And this mu will be a SL2R invariant quantity. For mu less than zero, uh, the solution will have uh, global time as a killing symmetry. Mu equal to zero, it will have Poincare time and mu greater than zero, it will correspond to a black hole geometry. Now in the presence of matter, one can again try to solve the equations and the most general solution for dilaton can be parameterized by two functions, this H function and K function, which de depends on only on X minus and X plus separately. And this H and K can be solved in, uh, in terms of the matter stress tensor T minus minus and T plus plus. T plus minus is just fixed by the conformal anomaly. So if you take classical null, uh, matter which satisfies the null energy condition T plus plus and t minus minus greater than zero. Then one can show that the entropy of uh, the future and black hole and cosmological horizon satisfy a sort of a second law. That this directly just follows from uh, using equations of motion. So second derivative of entropy is always less than zero. And uh, if the first derivative, suppose we start with a, some uh, matter-free solution, throw in some matter and then uh, finally stop the matter. It turns out that since second derivative is always negative and one can show that the first derivative at late times after the matter has fallen in at sufficiently late times, uh, the first derivative will be zero. Hello. 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 Yeah. Can, we... can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear. Okay. So the first derivative will go to zero 
the second derivative is negative and so it uh, it must be that the first derivative should have been positive before so the first derivative of entropy is basically the first derivative being positive is basically the statement that the entropy always increases so this is uh, for the case that the null energy condition t minus minus and t plus plus are actually positive with I mean they satisfy the null energy conditions okay uh, sunil what was uh, lambda c and lambda b sorry lambda c and lambda b are some affine parameters along the event horizon future black hole and cosmological horizons okay okay now the semi classical analysis uh, if we want to take quantum effects of matter into account uh, we can work in this limit where g newton goes to zero in the number of matter fields n goes to infinity with g newton n fixed in this case we'll have a conformal anomaly and uh, it will be given by n times r by 24 for the scalar fields uh, it will be since r is 2 it will be n by 12 pi and also we have to specify a choice of vacuum for the matter fields and uh, let's say we are in the vacuum with respect to some coordinate zeta plus and zeta minus and the metric in this coordinates suppose has a conformal factor which is given by this function f then the stress tensor for these matter fields uh, in this vacuum will be given by this quantity which depends on f to the half and second derivative of f to the minus half Again, we solve the equations of motion subject to this uh, stress tensor, and it suppose uh, we'll gen I, I'll say why uh, we are actually interested in uh, black hole like geometries, and those have this uh, Killing symmetry which corresponds to if you write the metric in R and theta coordinates that I was showing earlier, it will have this del theta Killing symmetry. And the only stress tensor which has this kind of killing symmetry and and also conserved are these two parameter family of stress tensors, which are labeled by these parameters A and B. I'm showing uh, the stress tensors in the uh, Poincare coordinates, and these A and B parameters can either be positive or negative. Now, the most general dilaton solution, uh, when uh, in the special case at A equal to B. I, I, I'll come to the. I'll, I'll tell the reason why we choose equal to be is this solution, um, where R star is some coordinate which is related to the Poincaré coordinates like this. Uh, in this, uh, if you look at this solution, this gn over three is just coming due to the conformal anomaly. This shift of dilaton is just coming due to the conformal anomaly, and the rest of the piece is uh, due to this t x plus x plus and t x minus x minus. And uh, I'm looking at a solution uh, in a black hole background. So if so, what happens actually is this dilaton blows up as R star R going to one, which which corresponds to the cosmo future cosmological horizon, and uh, which which is, in terms of R star coordinate is R star going to minus infinity. So the dilaton will blow up if A is positive. Sorry, it will become uh, sufficiently large and negative as R star goes to minus infinity on the cosmological uh, horizon. So, uh, we'll actually be interested in geometries in which the theta direction is actually compact because when I, uh, I'll, I'll come to uh, why theta direction has to be compact because when we do Dissiter JT path integral. Uh, the two boundaries will actually construct it from analytic continuation of ADS2 path integral. The ADS2 double trumpet path integral has a uh, theta direction compact. So we'll be interested in geometries in which the theta direction is compact. And that will correspond to these orbifold geometries, where the metric is this black hole geometry with theta direction being compactified to theta plus b. In general, this theta direction runs from uh, the, the range of the theta coordinate in the black hole geometry runs from minus infinity to plus infinity. But suppose we restrict it to the range theta goes to theta plus b, we'll just be left with this green part of the geometry. And one good thing that happens is now these regions are going to one, which which earlier caused a divergence, uh, uh, made the dilaton sufficiently negative. 
are excluded from this geometry but now we have a conical singularity at uh, this uh, center point which corresponds to uh, i think r equal to 1 and uh, theta sorry ah sorry yeah this r equal to 1 point yeah now this this simple uh, semi classical model is a sort of an example of a model of cosmology where we have a big crunch or a big bang singularity so you start from some initial past state which ends in some big crunch singularity or you start from this singularity and you end up at r equal to plus infinity sort of a big bang singularity so this semi classical geometry semi classical picture has this uh, big bang singularity one way to avoid this as i'll show is to uh, actually do a tunneling from minus ads to geometry start from start at minus infinity this pass boundary in dissiter go via minus ads to and end up at r equal to plus infinity by avoiding this uh, singularity okay so now to do that let's uh, i'll discuss about the exact path integral quantization for uh, dissiter jt gravity now most of the story about large diffeomorphism and small diffeomorphism goes through as before except that there are some factors of i in the action and so on uh, now we have to specify the contour for the uh, integration over the matrix and there are conventionally two different contours which are suggested in the literature the the conventional one being the hartle hopping uh, contour in which you start with a euclidean geometry and then uh, patch it on to a lorentzian geometry now uh, this is good for studying the case of disk with one boundary but when we have two boundaries uh, this is not feasible so we'll use an alternate uh, contour which is proposed by maldasena where we start with minus ads2 geometry evolve it sufficiently far into the future and then analytically continue in the uh, almost at the end to get a ds2 geometry okay in, in, just to ex explain it in terms of equations we start with the metric in terms of r and theta coordinates like this the region r less than 1 will describe sphere you can see if you make r equal to cos theta or sin theta you will get the sphere metric but the region r greater than 1 actually corresponds to ads2 but with an overall minus and if you take an overall minus sign outside the rest of the metric r square dr square over r square minus 1 plus r square minus 1 d theta square is a metric of ads2 so it's an ads2 with two negative time directions now if you take r going to plus minus ir you'll get a geometry like this which is minus dr square over r square plus 1 plus r square plus 1 d theta square which is a dissiter geometry in lorentzian so you can take this r uh, you can either start from r equal to 0 come till r equal to 1 sorry start from r equal to 1 which will be a north pole or a south pole of the sphere come till r equal to 0 and then do an analytic conjugation to go to lorentzian or you can actually start i have a question yes isn't theta like the time coordinate here so i mean r is just a r is just a radial coordinate right so it doesn't make sense to say that you are analytically continuing r you have to continue theta because theta is like the time right a at least in the finite no. temperature case it was it was inverse temperature so in the in the lorentzian case i, I would guess it would be the time no, but it's actually not ads2 but it's minus ads2 you this ads2 i mean this is euclidean ads2 and minus of that is two minuses no i agree but uh, if you if you are saying that you want to analytically continue r what exactly does it mean that's what i'm saying um see when, when you do conventional hartle hopping procedure you you just start from r equal to 1 Uh, which will be the north pole come till r equal to 0 which is the equator and then glue it on to uh, lorentzian which starts from r equal to 0 and goes off till infinity 
right? That that's the analytic conjugation we do when we say no boundary wave function. Yeah, but does it involve multiplying by minus i or plus i? No. Yeah. So here you are here you are not analytically continuing, but you are essentially changing the signature, right? I mean the. I mean, yes. you're going from, uh, say, you're doing the Lorentzian to Euclidean uh, change, except you're doing it in the R direction. What I'm yes. asking is, what does it mean physically to do that in the R direction? It's uh, Euclidean, from sphere to Lorentzian decitor, it's easy to think because Euclidean sphere, you understand it geometrically, it's a sphere. And then you are patching it onto a Lorentzian geometry. But uh, when I mean minus ADS two to zero, minus ADS two to DS, I'm saying instead of two comma zero signature where you have plus plus, you start with minus minus signature ADS two, and then you are analytically continuing. You are asking what is the physical significance of that? This, I don't know about but physics. Because in this case, in uh, doing it this way would change the signature of the space time itself. Yes. Apart from, yeah. apart from doing any sort of Lorentzian to Euclidean thing, it would change the signature of the space time itself. So uh, that's what I'm concerned about. Yeah, this is not generally what, like, in physics, we, we never do 2 comma 0 signature matrix. But suppose if you allow me to do it, we can actually show that this analytic conjugation that you do from minus ADS to, to DS will in the end give the same answer that you obtain from the Hartle Hawking prescription, where you start from sphere and go to DC. So okay. Both of the analytic conjugations will in the end give the same answer. So uh, let me just show this figure. So okay. uh, suppose this is R plane, complex R plane, and the R equal to one is the North Pole, let's say. Uh, there is this branch cut which which is for now uh, this branch cut is just uh, due to various eigen solutions of the determinant de uh, determinants that you are going to compute so for now just keep in mind that there is a uh, branch cut here and uh, you are starting let's say from the north pole uh, top of the branch cut at r equal to 1 all you are doing is you are coming till the origin and then do going up above to get the Lorentzian geometry. This blue line which is going above corresponds to the Lorentzian geometry. And uh, this horizontal part which comes from the point R equal to 1 till equator uh, till origin corresponds to the sphere part uh, from R equal to North Pole till the equator. Now you can also reach this point this way. You start from the uh, North Pole or R equal to 1 region, but you come along this direction from C to F. And then you do an analytic conjugation to B. So that's one way to reach the same point. This, this part from C to F and going to B will correspond to the analytic conjugation that I'm saying start from minus ADS2 and then go till uh, the end. And then finally, after you go to some large value of RB, you just analytically continue it to plus or minus I times RB. And you'll end up with B. You'll end up at B if you do the appropriate analytic continuation. So this is one way of doing the same thing, but it's it's different from the hartle hawking prescription. So you're st starting with a Euclidean ADS disk geometry with two negative directions, and then you are doing a different analytic continuation. This is more natural when we consider higher genus geometries. So that's why I'm. Uh, laying out the prescription even at the out level of the disk. Does that help? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, anyway, just, just go ahead. Yeah. So, in the vicinity, now once we uh, start with minus ADS2 in the vicinity of each boundary where R is very large, you'll get a metric of this form. And then uh, you can compute the on-shell action, uh, let's say for a non-wiggly boundary, and you can continue that to plus minus IR. And the wave function, which is e to the uh, S or minus S, 
will just be given by uh, this up, uh, whatever appropriately analytically continued answer. So you'll have two different analytic conjunctions are going to plus i or are going to minus i, and that will give either e to the plus i phi bl or e to the minus i phi bl. One of them will correspond to an expanding branch of the wave function. The other sign will correspond to the contracting branch of the wave function. So doing different analytic conjunctions will give you different types of uh, universes. Okay. Uh, actually, the uh, one can actually compute uh, when I say expanding or contracting branch of the wave function. Uh, you can actually compute a mini super space quantization in the second order formalism. And you'll see that uh, the conjugate momentum to the length, length of the boundary is given by minus phi dot by L. I'll, I'll describe this mini super space quantization if I have time towards the end. The conjugate momentum, if it's, if phi dot is negative, which means the universe is roughly, you think of phi as uh, the direction of the time. If time is taken towards the increasing value of the dilaton, this conjugate momentum will be negative if phi dot is po positive, which means for an expanding universe, this conjugate momentum is negative. And uh, if you impose a canonical commutation relations, the conjugate momentum will be, uh, you, is just the derivative of the length, derivative with respect to the length. And you can see, you can identify which factor among these corresponds to the expanding branch or the contracting branch. I think e to the minus i phi bl will correspond to the expanding branch and the one corresponding to plus will be a contracting branch. Okay, and, and uh, you can do this procedure for arbitrary number of boundaries. Now, I have just described this procedure for... If you have a phase, how does it imply expanding or contracting? I would I would imagine if you didn't have the I factor, then it would have given you kind of a sort of a exponential increase or decrease. But if you have a phase, then how does it imply a expanding or contracting? Uh, there is a I, I there, but when you calculate the uh, conjugate momentum from the wave function, this conjugate momentum for length will also have a factor of phi. Because L times L comma pi L is I. That's a commutation relations we impose. No, so is 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 that factor a conformal factor or the, that sits outside the uh, flat metric that give, gives rise to say Bisita sort of expansion? This factor, yeah. This factor, uh, sorry, which factor? This is just coming from uh, this SJT comma del is coming from this this term here, and the I is, uh, yeah. Uh, sorry, I'm starting from. I'm not directly computing it uh, in the D sitter. I'm just from starting from the ADS two with two negative signs using the action from ADS2 and then finally doing an analytic condition, right? So that's the prescription I'm using. So if you do that, this is the answer you get in ADS. And then once you analytically continue it, you'll get plus minus I times this plus minus I factor. Yeah, yeah. so when you interpret it as being expanding and contracting, exactly yes. what, what kind of analysis are you using? Okay, so the reasoning I'm using to call it a uh, expanding or uh, contracting branches. Suppose you do a mini super space quantization of this JT gravity in the second order formalism. Okay, let me go there directly. Okay, so if you just uh, do a mini super space approximation where you say phi is uh, dt square and d theta square and all the fields uh, row, I'm working in the gauge where actually you can do a full uh, ADM like uh, expansion and then uh, construct the conjugate momentum and so on. But let's say I'm working in some particular gauge where the lapse and shift are fixed to some specific values. And uh, in the mini super space approximation, this scale uh, e to the two rho, rho is only a function of time. It's independent of theta and phi is also a function of time independent of theta. From here, you can actually compute the, uh, the uh, Conjugate momenta corresponding to phi and uh, rho. 
you see from this part of the metric you can read off the length of the boundary which will be some e to the rho times theta okay and uh, for a fixed uh, value of t so the conjugate momenta corresponding to length will be something related to phi dot okay now when when i mean an expanding universe i'm thinking of a universe uh, whose phi value the value of the dilaton increases as time increases so phi dot will always be positive and the universe would essentially mean that the e to the 2 2 rho factor increases with time right e to the 2 rho the yes. scale factor increases with time i mean t if here t the time yes if t is a time, time t is just a coordinate is, t is just a coordinate here coordinate parameter the physical clock will be related to dilaton if you identify dilaton as a physical clock in your system no, no it should appear in the metric right i mean the physical clock should appear in the metric yes so t so, is, for me so far t is just a coordinate the actual clock you can think of dilaton as the actual clock the physical clock and there might be a, there will be a relation between phi and t because you specify phi as a function of t you can invert that relation and see phi use phi okay phi so i'm saying phi dot uh, so in that case phi should make a make an appearance in the metric in some way right because in front of t if you are saying t is time or whatever i mean in, 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 in phi should make some appearance in the metric in some way right Uh, maybe we can uh, postpone this to last session or something. Yeah. Okay. Like, uh, how much time do you need, Sunil? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I, I still have quite. A f okay. I you can tell me how much time I can afford, and then I'll plan it accordingly. I have few more yeah. discuss. Maybe ten minutes is enough. Okay. Sure. Sure. I'll just uh, describe few basic things, and then I'll not go into details. Yeah. Sure. okay so so yeah hmm. so you can you can question this why the uh, increasing value of dilaton is taken to be the expanding branch but okay for now if i'm saying direction of time is taken towards the increasing value of dilaton then it will fix my uh, sign appropriately one one branch correspond to expanding and uh, the other will correspond to a contracting branch and then now i have shown this for uh, single boundary but this can be generalized to arbitrary number of boundaries because you have ads2 geometries with arbitrary number of boundaries and you can all analytically continue each of the boundaries to plus ir or minus ir correspond which would then uh, describe either let's say a transition amplitude from some number of past universes to some number of future universes or nothing uh, some number of future universes to be produced from uh, nothing so it all depends on what kind of analytic conjugation we do at each of the boundaries okay so let's say now if, if i use this prescription and do it for two boundaries and uh, if i do this analytic conjugation at the analytic conjugations that i'm showing here you'll get a geometry which corresponds to a past to a future transition amplitude and if you do some different analytic conjugation you will get the universe corresponding two universes being produced from nothing this is sort of the analog of hartle hawking uh, for one bond but these kinds of uh, transition amplitudes and uh, nothing to two universes will actually will actually be suppressed by some this genus counting parameter e to the minus s not because this uh, this directly comes from the ads in ads you had this genus counting parameter e to the minus s not and it will carry over to ds so all these amplitudes will be higher and higher amplitudes with higher number of boundaries will all be suppressed now one can add matter in this in this uh, in this discussion and uh, repeat the same analysis and for let's say now the transition amplitude here from past to future you can ask the question of suppose i have uh, an initial state for the matter fields in the past what is the configuration that i get for the future matter fields what is the spectrum of uh, matter perturbations that i get in the future okay uh, after all 
suppose I start with some initial configuration for matter fields, which is given some Gaussian spectrum, Gaussian spectrum for the modes of the matter fields. Uh, I'll get some spectrum for the uh, future, uh, at the future boundary for the future values of the matter fields. It will be some complicated spectrum, which is a B dependent factor, and there is an integral over B. And it turns out that this will not be a scale invariant spectrum. If you calculate it for Hartle Hawking, you'll get so the Hartle Hawking answer will be something like this phi plus phi minus uh, two point function will be given by one over mod m. But now uh, for the transition amplitude, you'll get this m will be replaced by this function f of m, comma b, comma m, and then integral over p. So this is a departure from the scale invariance. And uh, now it depends on what values of B actually dominate this B integral. If small b dominates the integral, then you'll only see departures for more numbers. So actually, uh, this departures from the scale invariance will be observable for more numbers which are less than or of order B. So if the B integral is dominated by small values of B, then the departures will only be seen for small values of M. And if they depart, if if uh, the B integral is dominated for large values, you'll see that uh, the departures for the scale away from the scale invariance will be uh, seen for more numbers up till larger values of n. So this is one way to you know if you see the spectrum uh, from the spectrum, you can determine whether it's a uh, the wave function corresponding to a future universe that we live in. Uh, would it correspond to a no boundary uh, wave function or would it correspond to a wave function that is produced from a transition amplitude? So this is one signature. Okay, now uh, I'll skip this random matrix theory part, but okay, suppose now I want to, uh, so one can uh, through some factors of plus minus i's uh, extend the discussion of Dissiter JT uh, duality between Dissiter JT, uh, sorry, ADS and uh, random matrix theory to Dissiter uh, and random matrix theory. So this involves some factors of I, which I'm not going into details, but one other proposal for a hologram for Dissiter is this SYK model where, um, suppose we have a SYK model H here, we consider an SYK model with, uh, Hilbert space of n, n, n by two qubits or uh, with, uh, and there is a Hamiltonian operator, which is a momentum operator, which generates these translations along a space-like boundary. Remember now the Dissiter's boundary is a space-like boundary. So we have a well-defined Hilbert space and an operator which generates translations along these boundaries, but we don't have a notion of time in this hologram. Now, how do you, uh, how do you see, let's say, matter perturbation, uh, JT gravity, and so on? One thing we know is already uh, from ADS uh, analysis, the low energy spectrum of SYK model matches with the uh, low energy spectrum that you obtain from random matrix theory. And uh, you'll reproduce uh, it is dual to JT gravity in the low energies. So for T, energy is much smaller than J, where J is the scale that enters. That, that governs the uh, two point function of this uh, random couplings. So SYK can be shown like it captures the information of JT gravity. But now if you want to capture, let's say JT gravity plus matter, let's say light matter that we are using so far in the analysis of JT gravity. One thing you can do is add an additional scalar field to the SYK model with the action uh, shown here phi is a dynamical field with phi dot square and some random coupling g i j k l which uh, which uh, governs a coupling between the fermions and the dilaton uh, sorry the, the extra matter field and this additional g i j k l is a random coupling which is taken which with whose end scaling is uh, uh, of a particular form so that when you do the integral over the fermion fields the back reaction of this uh, additional scalar field can be ignored in terms of n counting. And so the saddle point for fermion still continues to be the one that you obtain without using in the absence of this additional scalar field. 
now at low enough energies once we ignore the, we can ignore this uh, kinetic term for the additional matter field and you can uh, integrate out the fermions to give a description in terms of this conventional flavor singlet by local fields g and sigma fields that would result in a coupling to the scalar as follows you see this g side to the four term phi of t and phi of t so this is sort of a two point function and in the conformal limit for the fermions this g psi will be a power law which will which will be given which will have this 1 over t minus t prime to the 2 for the q equal to 4 fermion model so uh, in this way we can couple the extra mass massless fields or light matter which which on the gravity side we have discussed also we all, we can also obtain the same thing from the syk side by introducing a random coupling to the fermions so so this syk theory with some additional matter can be it's it's still a very uh, uh, early stage for this proposal for us we don't have any exact calculation but we can we can roughly say that uh, this additional syk theory with this additional matter is a candidate for ue completion of jt gravity with additional matter but one crucial thing in the whole analysis uh, in this analysis is the absence of a norm once we we know how to calculate wave function but we don't know what what is a norm that you have to use on the space of wave functions and that is something which we are still working on okay um, i think i can end here there are some additional things which i wanted to tell but i think it's 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 okay i can end here at this point hello yeah. Uh, hello yeah uh, so yeah thanks anil for the nice talk uh, so if there are any questions like Okay. Uh, if there are any more questions, uh, let's thank Sunil for the wonderful talk. Uh, yeah. So see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.